Hello again. We're in Walter Rauschenbusch, Christianity and the Social Crisis, page 103. This subhead is The Hope of the Coming of the Lord. The hope of the immediate return of Christ dominated the life of primitive Christianity. Its missionary zeal, its moral energy, its theological conceptions, and its outlook on the world, the interests it cherished and the interests it repudiated, can all be understood only under the high atmospheric pressure of that expectation. This great culminating event was believed to be very near. Paul too believed that. It is often asserted that he modified his expectations as time went on. It would be strange if he did not, but there is no change traceable in his thought on this point sufficiently to modify his conception of the historic mission of Christianity. The possibility that he personally might depart before the Lord returned deepened into probability and then into certainty. But it was always a question of years and decades with Paul and never of centuries. The return of the Lord meant the inauguration of the kingdom of God. What the prophets had foretold, what the people had longed for, and what John the Baptist had proclaimed as close at hand would come to pass when Jesus returned from heaven to reign. He had not achieved his real mission during his earthly life. The opposition of the rulers had frustrated that. It had been God's will. But he was still the Messiah of Israel. The national salvation was bound to come. The kingdom would yet be restored to Israel. In a very short time, he would descend from heaven, and then all their hopes would be fulfilled in one glorious and divine act of consummation. Their preaching was with a view to that event. They sought to do for his second coming what John the Baptist had sought to do for his first coming, to proclaim repentance to the people and to gather a holy remnant. The Christian hope of the parousia was the Jewish hope of the messianic kingdom, except that the person of the Messiah had gained wonderfully in concreteness and attractiveness, and the hope had become far more vivid and intense. The coming Messiah was the master whom they knew and loved. He had ascended on high to receive the kingdom from his father, and soon they would see him again, perhaps tomorrow or the day after. Ideas could well differ as to what the kingdom implied and the return of Christ would usher in. Some would place the emphasis on the spiritual blessings, others on the social justice and emancipation that would be involved in the perfect reign of God. It was an ideal, and a very capacious and elastic ideal. The early Christians were no more unanimous about their eschatology than the Jews had been, and than we are today. Paul expected an immediate spiritualization of the entire cosmos. The dead would be raised in a spiritual body, the living would be transformed into the same kind of body, for flesh and blood and the nature of things could not share in that spiritual kingdom. Death would cease, nature would be glorified, and the long travail of all creation would end, and the children of God would be manifested in their glory. In Paul's program of the future, there is no room for a millennium of happiness on this present earth. Only the dogmatic theory that all scripture writers must hold the same view can wedge the millennium into Paul's scheme of the coming events. His outlook is almost devoid of social ele elements. To him, the spirit was all. This material world could only be saved by ceasing to exist. Now here's where Rauschenbusch, of course, would run into a roadblock of opposition with the premillennial position. Rauschenbusch being a Baptist, yeah, that was the majority view of moderate Baptists and liberal-leaning Baptists in that day, and probably still is among the liberal in the liberal churches, but the conservative churches are more and more committed to the old position which is there is a way to wedge the millennium, an earthly millennium between the second coming and, and the final consummation, which is new heavens and new earth. So I would disagree with Rauschenbusch on this, but I, I see where he's coming from. If you just based your eschatology on the New Testament, you would probably come to similar conclusions to Rauschenbusch, because he does cite 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 8, 18 to 25, and then cites Weiss's book, very famous at the time, on Paul's eschatology. But I don't think it's fair to Paul or to the New Testament to insist that everything about eschatology has to be summarized or uh, 
brought to its uh, perfect realization in the New Testament. I don't think, given what he said about Paul here, that, that Paul is working on the assumption that the Old Testament prophecies will be fulfilled almost instantly. When that's the case, I don't think we're, we should expect that Paul or the other New Testament writers would somehow supersede or, or think to supersede the prophecies of the Old Testament. But that's a big debate, which we won't have here. Next time, Rauschenbusch goes further on the Christian hope, especially the Christian hope as expressed in the Apocalypse and other writings of the New Testament. I'll put a link into the Parousia. What does, do the experts, the Greek experts, say about the Parousia, especially compared to what the Watchtower says about the so-called invisible presence? And also to a video we did on Tom Wright, who has probably written more influentially on the kingdom of God in this last generation than any other writer.